two episodes ago, I talked about what is good code. I explained you why good code is much more than just correct code. Today, I'm going to continue with this topic and I will focus on one part, one characteristic that I have only briefly mentioned before, which is readability. I will talk about why it is important to make your code as easy to understand, as readable as possible. And I will give you a few techniques, a few very simple, very easy techniques that you can start using today that will make your code easier to grasp, easier to understand, not only by your feral team members, but also by you in the future. My name is Gregory, you're watching Becoming a Senior Developer. Let's start. First thing first, why is it important to make your code easy to understand? I'm pretty sure that if you work in a team, you already know the answer. You know that the code that you write today will be read by some other people tomorrow and in two days and in two weeks and maybe in two months. Other developers will read it in order to understand what you meant when you were writing this code. They will read it in order to introduce some changes. And as I mentioned in the previous video, you can't change what you can't understand. Therefore, it is critical to make the code as easy to understand as possible. But even if you don't work in a team, if you work as a single developer on a project that nobody else will ever look at, it is good to care about the readability of your code because if you get back to some function, to some class in a week or two, you will not have the same context as you have right now when you are writing code. You will forget why you made certain decisions, why you solved certain things in the way you did it and not in another way. Remember that a single line of code might be written once but it might be read tens or hundreds or thousands of times. By spending a bit more time today thinking about how to make this code more self-explanatory, how to make it more readable, you might be saving yourself and other people a lot of time in the future. So all these techniques that I will show are focused on this particular thing, on making the code a little bit easier to understand or making sure that whoever reads it will spend a little bit less time trying to grasp what you meant when you wrote it. Let's start with visual part. When we read something, no matter what, whether it's an article, a book, a scientific paper, or a piece of code, we tend to stop at parts that bring our attention. So when you write an article, you have a lot of ways to bring the reader's attention to certain parts. You can add headers, subheaders, you can add bullet points, you can make the font bold, you can add some quote, etc. etc. When we write code, we don't have so many options. We can't make the font bold. We can't even set the colors. The color scheme or syntax highlighting fully depends on the reader's text editor. What we can do though is use white spaces. Proper indentation, line breaks, empty lines, these three things can make a really big difference and they can make code much easier or much harder to read and to understand. Have a look at these two functions. This is some code that I wrote years ago. On both sides, you can see the same function. It does exactly the same thing. There are no differences in expressions or statements here. But you can easily see that one of these functions look easier to read, it looks better organized. The function on the left, even though it's shorter, it looks like just one piece of code. It is hard to see what to focus on. On top of that, the indentation in this function is wrong. You can see that the second if is on the same level as the first one, at least visually, but not semantically. This if should be inside. So this function is not only less readable, but it's really confusing. On the other hand, the function on the right, even though it's longer, it's like 12 lines longer, looks better organized. You can see that the first part of the function is about assignments. I declare some variables that I will use later. The next line draws your attention because it's surrounded by empty lines. I'm saying here, look at this line. 
it is separate from what is before and after this. Then we have a clear separation between two if statements. You see that the second if statement is inside the first. Therefore, whatever happens inside the second if will be executed only if both the first and second if return true. And then you've got two return statements, which I split into multiple lines and I put blank lines just before them. The blank line separates the statement from the previous one. It says here we do something different. We are returning the value. We are finishing this function. And splitting the statement into multiple lines makes it easier to read because our eyes don't have to move from left to right so much. Shorter lines generally are easier to read than longer lines. So the technique here is first make sure that you have properly indented code. It is extremely important for whoever will try to read it. And second, don't be afraid to use blank lines. They make the code a little bit longer, but they make it much easier to read. Okay, now we're moving to more semantic techniques. Whenever you use an if-else conditional and you have two paths and one of them is considered a happy path or a more common scenario, you should check for this path first. While both the if and else parts are technically equal, they're not equal when it comes to code readability because one of them, the if part, comes first. So naturally, we will read it first. That's why it's better to put a happy, a more common scenario there and only leave the unhappy, the error part, the failure part for later. This way, when I try to have a very brief overview of what the function does, I can just jump to this if and check the conditional that checks the page was fetched successfully, the user was created successfully. And I don't need to read the error handling for now because I just want to have a brief overview of what's happening. Additionally, when thinking of errors, we think that error is the negation of success. Therefore, when you put the successful scenario in the else part, you will be thinking if error, else, and else means not error, and not error is not not success. So we have kind of this double negation when reading the code in our minds. Again, have a look at an example that I have here. We have two functions that do exactly the same thing. And the only difference between them is that I swapped the if and else parts. So this function is supposed to fetch some news and it fetches them from the URL. And if it fails, then it will fall back to a cache and it will fetch some older news. So now the function on the left checks if I don't have latest news, and then it has a bunch of code that handles the failure scenario. And then in the else part, I have what is my successful scenario. Of course, this function has more issues than just the if else swap. It's actually too long and it should be split into more functions. But let's focus on just this particular conditional part. When I read it in my mind, I read it as if not latest news, then something else, something else. And I find it easier for me to read if latest news, then something else, because then the else is not latest news. It's not 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 latest news. So again, technically these two functions are the same. They have the same number of lines. They work exactly the same way. The only difference is improved readability in the second version. A good alternative to if else conditional is using early returns. So instead of checking if success, then handle success, L handle error, you do if error, then handle error and return. And whatever happens after the if is the happy path. So the happy path, in other words, is aligned to the left. So why does it work well? Because thanks to that, this if is just a short distraction. So if something then returned, and then you just continue with the main flow. And whenever you look at the most left, the most top level of indentation in the function, you will know that you are in the main flow of the function. Let's check another example. We have a checkout class that has one public method. 
which performs a checkout in some kind of imaginary e-commerce setting. The method has three if-else conditionals. First, we check whether the user has enough balance, like some kind of credits or points. Then, we check whether the items are still available. Finally, we create an order and see if the creation of the order was successful. In the first version of this class, the happy path is represented in three nested ifs, and it's quite difficult to understand what's happening there and which else refers to which if. What's worse, because of the different error messages for each failure, we can't just combine all these three ifs into one if something and something and something. The second version is rewritten to return as soon as we notice a failure. User does not have enough balance? Return a failure with proper error message. If some product is not available, we return a failure. The order failed for some reason? We return a failure. So you can see that the flow of the function is much clearer and the happy path is moved to the left. It is in the main flow. It's not hidden in some nested conditional. It's there at the bottom of the function. After we handle the possible failures, we just continue the happy path. The next technique is to avoid reassigning variables. Now, this technique does not always apply, and I will explain you in a moment why. But first, let me say why it works in a lot, a lot of cases. So, reassigning variable basically means that you assign some value to a variable, and then you assign another different value to the same variable. It is extremely common in programming, and well, variables are called variables for a reason, because they vary. So why am I suggesting to avoid reassigning variables? The main reason is that when you assign a value to a variable, it represents some idea. And then when you change that value, the idea of what this variable represents might change as well. Look at these two lines of code that I have here. In the first line, we define a variable called categories, and we have all the categories that we have in our imaginary e-commerce store there. And in the second line, I say that from now on, the categories are only those categories that have at least one product. So if I have only these two lines of code, it's fine. But if I put some code between them, then I need to be aware of what the categories variable means at a certain point of time. Because sometimes it means all categories and sometimes it means categories that have at least one product. How to solve this issue? There are two ways. First, just create two variables. One can be called categories, the second might be called active categories. Now, each variable represents a separate idea. The idea of categories is separate from the idea of categories that have at least one product. And the second way is to assign the value once and immediately set it to the final value that we need. So in this case, I can just combine two lines and say that categories immediately will be only those categories that have at least one product. Of course, this works only when you don't need the previous value anywhere. Let's have a look at another example. In this case, I have a variable named query that represents some SQL query to be executed to fetch some data from the database. In every single line, I'm adding something more to that query. And in every single line, the variable query holds some different value. If I try to execute the query after the first line, it will fail because I don't have table C defined, a table that is necessary in this query. After the second line, I have the table, but I don't have join conditional. After the third line, the query is correct and it will fetch the results that I want but it will not limit the number of results and it will not order them. So again, why do I reassign this variable? I have just one query that I want to execute. Therefore, I should assign this value at once. I can turn it into a one log string or I can just combine the strings without reassigning the variable all the time. As I mentioned a moment ago, there are cases where reassigning variables is a good idea. Let me show you an example. Here we have a function named play chess which executes a loop in which, in each turn, in each iteration, we let the current player make a move and then we switch the active player. We say that if the current player was zero, then right now it will be one. 
if the current layer was one, now it will be zero. So I'm reassigning the same variable in every iteration. But in every iteration, all the time, this variable represents the same idea. So if you have such case, you should absolutely reassign the variable. It's not always a bad idea. In this case, you shouldn't try to find some other way. Reassignment is perfectly fine. You should just always be aware whether the idea behind what this variable represents is the same or whether it changed. Okay, let me squeeze this last advice in. I have already mentioned it two episodes ago, but I want to remind you about it because I see this problem all the time. Never call variable data. When I see the variable name data, I have no idea what it means. I have to go back in code to see where it was defined, to see where it was assigned the last time. The name data doesn't tell me anything about what value is there. In the worst case, just add some now to say what data, user data, client data, product data. It's already much, much better than just data. All right, folks, that's it for today. I hope that you enjoyed it. Make sure to take care of your fellow developers. Make your code as easy to understand, as easy to read as possible so that your team members or so that future you finds it easier to get the idea of what the author of the code tried to achieve. Remember that communication is an extremely important part of software development and writing code that is self-explanatory or that it's provided with good comments is part of the communication. And communication is going to be the topic of my next episode. Next week, I'm going to talk about how to support less experienced developers in your team, how to help them, even if you do not feel very confident about your own skills yet. Stay tuned and see you next week.